short story, true story, about two brothers named Moshi and Yuval. I know, strange names, right? They don't live around here. They live on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Their families have lived there for generations, fishing out of the Sea of Galilee. Now, these two brothers, Moshe and Yuval, they have kind of become very keen archaeological or amateur archaeologists, finding different artifacts from Jewish and Christian eras. But their real fame to claim or claim to fame came in 1986 when there was a great drought around the Sea of Galilee and the waters receded so much that new parts of the beach were exposed. And there they found, sticking out of the mud, a sailing vessel. They immediately reported their find to the authorities who came and began to dig. They wanted to do this quickly because you never know when the rains might come and the find would be lost. They spent 12 days digging and then, having recovered this vessel, they put it in a chemical solution for seven years. It preserved it, and now this find is on display in Moshe and Yuval's hometown in Kibbutz Genezer in a museum. You can go right now and see this sailing vessel. Now, the reason it's such a big deal and a big find is that this vessel is dated to have existed about 40 years before the birth of Jesus, give or take 80-some years either way, which means this is a real boat from the time that Jesus and his disciples were crisscrossing the Sea of Galilee. And it's a big deal because its dimensions give us very good evidence, and 13 men could easily sit within its 27-foot length and 8-foot width. It had a flat bottom, could easily be pulled up right to the shore and then launched from the shore. Now, nobody is suggesting that this particular boat was the one that Jesus was on, or it was owned by any of the disciples. But it does have some historical uh, relevance in that boats like this were used at that time. It was common. It helps us understand that if a boat like this were loaded down with 13 people, about 1,500 pounds of people, it had a four-foot-high side on it, You put that in rough seas, and yeah, water's going to flow in over the side. It also had in the stern of the boat, that's the back, a little platform in which a captain could sit and steer, but also someone could throw a little cushion and take a nap. And that's where we find Jesus today. And he wanted to go across the sea with his disciples in a boat very similar to this. He had been with a large crowd of people for days, teaching about the kingdom of God and and healing and just being with people. Now, I have a little confession to make. Being with lots of people, hundreds of people, maybe thousands, it's exhausting to hear everyone's story, to, to truly care for them and spend time with each person. Jesus was happy to do it. He wanted to spend the time, so much so that he would go without eating, He would go without sleeping. But at a certain point, the human body hits the wall. You have nothing more to give. You have to withdraw and sleep. Well, it was at that point that Jesus gave his disciples the look. You know the look I'm talking about. You're at a party, at some kind of gathering. You're ready to go. And you look at the people you came with, and you give them the look. You might even mouth the words, let's go. The disciples took Jesus just as he was, which is a simple way of saying they didn't stop, change clothes for the voyage. They didn't make a fire and cook supper. You almost get the sense that like an injured football player being carried off the field, they kind of help him into the boat. And as soon as his head hits the cushion, he's out. Exhaustion has taken over. The disciples are fine. They've rowed boats like this all their lives. Many of them were fishermen. So they can handle what's before them of getting across the lake. Being experienced fishermen, they would know not to go out on the water if there's a big storm coming. 
even though it was nighttime and they could not see clouds building, there was obviously nothing before then that suggested a big storm was coming. But living in Kansas, you know how quickly the winds can change. It can be nice and calm, a little, little breeze out of the south, and then boom, 40, 50 mile an hour wind from the north, just like that. Well, they must have had a pleasant voyage about into the middle of the lake, and then such a change of weather happened. And at first, maybe they thought they could ride this thing out, we can get back to shore. At some point, they realized they're going nowhere except extremely high and extremely low and extremely high and extremely low. And the boat that they were in provided them really no protection from the wind and waves and that they were getting just as wet inside the boat as if they were on the outside of the boat. In their panic and their desperate uh, struggle just to stay afloat, they were rather put off by what Jesus was doing. He was sleeping still, which really conveyed to them, talk about you know, what, what's in his mind and his heart, and the, he didn't care. You know, they said as much. And, and not, a, not an urgency about Jesus, not, not a care or concern that, that we're all going to drown. Now, just hit the pause button for a moment on this. What if this boat had sunk and everybody drowned, dead? That would be a very different ending to Mark's gospel, right? But it's just unthinkable. There is no way that God Almighty, who planned with His Son before the creation of the world, to come into this world, to be born of the Virgin Mary, to live His life as an offering for the entire world, to rescue this world from sin and death and hell. There's no way that God would get his son to this point and then lose him in the sea, shrugging his celestial shoulders, going, well, pfft, didn't see that coming. You know, these storms, they just come out of nowhere. Who can predict? Jesus, even as he slept, has the care and the concern of the world well under his protection. Even as he is unconscious, dead to the world, he has a full attention to his closest friend's welfare, Peter, James, and John. See, God is never surprised by the events of this world. He's never caught off guard by any hurricane or earthquake or tsunami. He's never surprised by a terrorist bomb or a war that breaks out. He is never at a loss of what to do in any of the diagnosis that you might receive in this life. He's never at a point where he goes, I just don't know what we're going to do now. He has all the events of this world, every last thing and event, working and threading each and every event of history so that all things, all things work out for our eternal good. But do we believe it? When we look at the faith of the disciples in that boat, we have to conclude that they did have a, a significant amount of faith and that they left everything to come and follow Jesus. They left their homes, their wives, their children, fields, boats behind. They had spent enough time witnessing all the miracles hearing all of the stories, participating in many of the miracles. When they were in trouble in that very moment, they went immediately to Jesus. They didn't pray to some other God or hope in luck. So it's not a small thing, their faith. But what they did not yet have is belief in Jesus. They believed in Jesus that He could do things. They just did not believe Jesus. It seems like a very small distinction that is even hard to hear. What, what's the difference between believing in Jesus and believing Jesus? Believing in Jesus is that, well, you know that He's there and, and that He can do things and that He has done things and all that's in the Bible, it's all true. But when it's you, 
and it's Jesus. Is He the one that your heart looks to? As we consider all the things that we face in this life, do I really believe? See, you really won't know where you're at, whether you just believe in Jesus or you believe Jesus until the wind and the waves, until your life is in peril or life's very difficult. You're going to lose what is very precious to you. You're going to lose what you've worked all of your life to, to have and to enjoy. And there you might find, just like the disciples, that you're not so sure. In fact, you might even conclude, Jesus, I don't believe you. I believe my eyes that we're going to drown. I believe my circumstances. I'm going to lose everything. I believe that you're not doing anything right now to fix this. I believe right now that you might not even care about me. Why would Jesus allow his dearest friends to go through such a traumatic, terrifying ordeal? See, it's, that's where we find ourselves. God, why are you allowing this to happen? Don't you care? But what if, what if God has allowed the very things that are happening to you and to me, what if He is the very one, He Himself, who has brought and put you into perilous situations, or if not specifically put you there, have allowed the circumstances of life to bring you to that point. What if He has done this because He knows in His wisdom that this is the way of faith? There is no other path of faith. This is the way that it goes. There's no other way to grow from believing in God that he, He's there and He can do things to believing God. That's a very, very challenging question. And the disciples had no answer of faith. As they stood and held on to the boat, Jesus stood up. And He spoke to the wind and the waves. Wind doesn't have ears, right? Waves do not have a mind to consider what's being said to them. And yet, when Jesus spoke, everything became extremely calm. Have you ever had that moment in the car when you're driving down the road and you almost die? You know, some big accident just about happened, but just as quickly as it happened, it didn't happen. What's your heart doing at that point? You know, it's like bouncing out of your chest and onto the dashboard. And, and then when you realize, I'm going to be okay, you might even have to pull the car over to the shoulder and just sit for a little bit. Imagine going up and down and the churn of the ocean, the wind and the terror, the screams of the men, and then silence. Imagine then kind of putting your paddle back into the boat. woo We made it, Okay. And then hearing Jesus say in a very plain and calm voice, Why are you so afraid? Do you still yet have no faith? Now, I don't think Jesus was angry when he said this, when he asked those questions. Dismayed, probably, because, you know, they've been with him for a really long time. Disappointed. They should probably have had faith by now, right? but not angry and fed up like, as soon as we get to the other side, I am getting me 12 new disciples fed up. And yet the questions that Jesus asked were appropriate to probe the heart and to see what is really there. What are you holding on to? The boat? Really? Calm waters? Still seas? pleasant and happy life? What are you and I holding on to? What would we become desperate and anxious and, and just assume that God has abandoned us to the waves if we have lost? What are we holding on to? As you consider in your soul what you're holding and grasping to, 
asked the same questions that the disciples asked of themselves. They said to one another, who is this that can speak to the wind and waves? And they listened. Who is this that can give himself into death on a cross and death cannot hold him? Who is this who would so love me to give up his life into death? And then as you think of all the wind and the waves that you're going through, to realize that this God is not going to let your boat turn over. He's not going to leave you at the bottom of the lake with a shrug of his shoulders going, well, pff, I tried. I didn't know that was going to happen to you. Woo. Who could have seen it coming? Can't do anything now. Your God, who has all things in his hands. As you ask those questions, what is my soul holding on to? Allow the Holy Spirit to answer, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my wealth and my possessions that even if all of these are lost, I am yours. I trust you. To such a faith, the waters are calm and the wind is still. Such a faith is yours in Jesus. Amen. We stand. We confess our faith.